Uh, thanks so much for coming. I very much appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to, to go through this with me. So my name is Mike Amender. I'm an experimental psychologist at Valve. So this is what I spend most... <laughs> right, so this is how I spend most of my time. Uh, so I'm actually not a, a clinical psychologist. Um, you know, Gabe may require uh, some work, but that's not my, not my area of expertise. I'm an experimental psychologist. So I work on... Um, uh, applying knowledge and methodologies from psychology to game design. So thinking about how, how knowledge of human behavior can, can impact the choices that we're making. So just really quick overview for, for those of you who are familiar with psychology. It's essentially just the study of human behavior and its influences. And what psychologists do, we, we look for regularity or patterns in behavior. Um, we want, you know, humans uh, react to certain situations in, in somewhat predictable ways, and psychologists try and figure out what those ways are and why it's happening. On the game design side of things, I'm sure everybody has their own definition of game design. Everybody in this room, in the, in this room will have their own. Uh, for the purposes of the talk, just we have kind of a, a, a shared context, um, I'm going to define game design here as a, a series of constraints and choices and systems presented to a player. Um, and typically, uh, you know, these constraints and choices and systems and so forth uh, induce a behavior or response. Uh, and the hope is that we, we can take uh, what we know about psychology, um, about the predictable ways humans might react or respond um, and apply it to game design um, and induce various, um, various responses or particular responses. So here's a, a kind of a roadmap for the talk. Um, I'm going to go through kind of seven distinct topics um, that should all uh, hopefully, um, you know, be, you know, contain somewhat, you know, at least novel or surprising information about the ways in which players are reacting. And so we'll talk about attention and how preferences are made, um, a few cognitive biases, uh, talk about the fallibility of internal reflection, our ability to, to rationalize and explain why we do the things that we do, uh, give you an example of, of how we made use of a phenomenon known as cognitive dissonance to reduce player toxicity in Dota, uh, talk a little bit about player agency, I have a couple slides there, and then end with just a discussion of motivation, how do we keep people playing our games, um, how do we keep people engaged uh, in, in the products that we're making. So attention and its failings, this is kind of a, uh, maybe a somewhat suggestive title, but uh, the thinking is that uh, with attention, um, the important point to keep in mind is that we attend to far less of the world than we think we do. If I say, what's your area of focus? If you hold out your arm and hold up your thumb, the width of your thumb at arm's length, that's how much of your environment you are actively attending to. Um, we're very good at switching and sw moving attention pretty quickly, and people in our games have to do this quite a bit, um, but the area of focus is this much um, of your environment. Um, you know, we, we're still aware of things outside of it, and things can capture our attention. At, and um, it, it, I guess the, uh, the, the point I want to make is that if this is the area of focus, um, you know, players in our games uh, might not see as much of the world as we think they do. And, and in fact, we do attend to far less of the world than we think we do. Our brain does a very good job of creating kind of a stable representation or illusion of a stable representation of the world, and we trust it. But um, we're not as aware of the world as we think we are. And focusing attention is effortful. Um, we ask players in our games to, to focus attention, engage in battles, uh, search for things, and navigate, and so forth. And focusing attention is effortful. And I'm going to walk through kind of a, a pretty specific instantiation of that in a little bit. And so I want to talk about attention because there are implications here for game design. So let's go through um, you know, things we, we probably all know, um, but just to get a background for, for how attention can work. So there are various ways that attention can be captured. Uh, sudden appearances of things uh, will capture attention. We do this in games all the time. Color changes will capture attention. Looming motion will capture attention. This comes from... Uh, it's an there's an evolutionary reason for this. Uh, if an object is suddenly increasing, uh, increasing its, uh, uh, the amount of your field of view that it's taking up, uh, it might be something worth orienting to, like it could be a threat. And so we typically are, are very oriented to, to looming motion. And then size changes as well. And again, we make use of all these in our games and none of this is meant to be surprising. It's just kind of uh, you know, focusing on the background uh, the other point I want to make is that, so it's not only the physical properties of a stimulus that can capture our attention, it's color, it's size, it's motion, and so forth. It's also the attentional goals 
that you have matter. So uh, I guess as an example, uh, psychologists call these attentional set. I'm using the words attentional goals just because uh, I think it's a little bit clearer. Uh, if you're in a room and you're looking for your friend and your friend is tall and blonde, uh, you're going to be more likely to notice people who are tall and blonde uh, and less likely to notice people who are perhaps short and have dark hair. Right? So this is an example of an intentional goal, and it does scope um, what things you will attend to in that environment. Um, and people make use of this in our games as well. If you're searching for gold coins, you're going to be oriented to go towards gold objects uh, in the game. Right? So when attention is focused, as it often is in our games, players will miss and can miss very salient uh, and surprising things. Let me show you this happening in a game. So this is a video. Uh, this is Counter-Strike, one of our games. Uh, there's two teams trying to kill each other. Uh, we have one player left on either team. And this video actually happened two weeks ago, so it was very fortuitous timing. Uh, I'll let you guys watch and see what happens. We should have sound here. Yeah. You can hear it? OK. But he is there. He's here. I tied in there. Look. Left. Left. There. 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 Left. There. there. You have to the right. My flower pot. Flower pot. Behind you, you have. You have. He's there. Down. 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 Behind you, you have. There. Oh my God. He's there. Dude. You have. He's there. Look. Give you. Oh my God. You have. <laughs> oh my god! You're such a f***ing idiot, you are! Alright, okay. Alright, <laughs> so, okay. We had to, we had to tone down my language because this is a, a family presentation. But, uh, so, um, th this guy who was playing is good at Counter-Strike. If you're watching, um, you know, he's, he's clearing corners, like his crosshairs are always looking for um, where he thinks, you know, at the he proximate head height, where he thinks people are going to be. But what he ended up missing was there was a guy in the center of his screen just crouched down right in the center of his viewpoint. Um, and he didn't see him because he didn't expect that, that person to be there. Um, like, you know, he, he was, you know, playing Counter-Strike. Like, there are certain way, areas where people hide. Um, they don't often hide in plain sight. And so, like, his, you know, his attentional goals were, like, I'm going to look for in all the common places uh, somebody could hide and not actually have them be, um, you know, and, and not actually see them where they actually were. And so this is the same finding as the gorilla video, right? When attention is focused, um, or you know, attention is guided in some way, like he's using predictable cues, he's acquired as a, a skilled Counter-Strike player. Uh, you know, you, you can miss very salient things, including the very thing that you're looking for. So the implications here are that you know, very salient objects can be hidden in plain sight. Um, so if you understand the attentional goals of your player, you can create surprises um, when attention is focused elsewhere. Um, and then conversely. Don't be surprised when they miss very obvious things. Like, un understand what the intentional goals are, and maybe you know, the cues you're giving to your player are guiding them to miss something. You know, if they're focused on attacking an enemy, the, they're not going to be focused on looking for cues to an exit, um, for example. So you know, think about the goals you're priming in your player. And you know, when they are missing obvious things, try and understand why. And you know, make use of this. Right? Like you can, we can create pretty compelling and novel surprising experiences uh, when attention is focused. Um, yeah, and I guess one t topic I'm, I can't really talk about now, but the, the notion of like introducing gradual changes is, is pretty important. Um, you know, I talked about sudden appearances where something just appears. If you have something slowly fade into view, people, just because they, there's not a strong change signal, um, people are going to be more likely to miss that. So, so the notion of um, gradually altering an environment, very difficult for people to notice. Um, so definitely something you guys can take, um, make note of, and you're happy to chat more about that uh, afterwards. So we talked about ways in which attention can fail. Let's move on to um, ways in which not preference cannot maybe not fail, but um, talk about, I guess, the, the ways in which preference is, is constructed. So by preference, I mean, you know, what are the things you like? Um, I think lots of us would, would like to believe that uh, we tend to like things based off some, you know, you know, at least internally, some objective estimation of, of how much, you know, I guess our, our own reactions to a thing, um, you know, a, a sense of enjoyment. We kind of calibrate towards that. Uh, but the point that I'm going to kind of lead you guys towards is that preference is probably more arbitrary than deliberate. Um, and, and this has consequences for game designers. You know, so why do players choose to favor a particular game over another or a particular strategy inside of a game? 
or a character, or a weapon, a level, or a game mode? Um, you know, is, is it all just, hey, everyone is doing their own kind of internal calculations about what's best, or are other things at play? So uh, you guys can probably guess by all the leading questions I'm going to ask, uh, ask in this talk, other things are at play. So here's a character list in Dota. Uh, so D Dota is one of our games. You have 112 characters, two teams of five. Um, everybody uh, can get, gets, gets to pick one character. Uh, so a whole bunch of characters. So what if I said, rank your favorite heroes? Tell me which heroes in Dota do you prefer? Uh, you would say Anti-Mage is first, because obviously he is, he's the best Dota hero. Legion Commander second, Pudge, uh, Templar, Naga, uh, Skywrath, and then Windrunner, all the way down the line. But so you would, have, you would give me a ranking of heroes in Dota. That's all well and good. What psychologists have realized is that if you do something else, if I say, here are the heroes that everybody else likes. Here's the average collective you know, preferences of the player base at large. They're going to be different. Well, so th this is what you said. Here's a different set of heroes. Here's what the player base thinks. Uh, you know, Bloodseeker, Tusk, Ember, and so forth. What happens, and then I'm just like, OK, you have the player base's rankings. What are your rankings now? Your rankings change. And this, is, this happens you know, in a variety of contexts. Um, psychologists have studied this for you know, uh, kind of a bunch. And it, it's a somewhat, I, guess, I think, start, you know, surprising result. Um, like our preferences are influenced by what other people think. And I mean, that, that is OK. But the notion that um, what I actually like will change simply because you told me what other people like, like that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Because um, we, we, we do this in our games quite a bit. We give players cues to what other people like, what we as game designers like about the game. And players will react to that. And preferences will change and adapt accordingly. So here are a few examples of, of the, the ways in which we as game designers do this in our games and, and cue players to, to actually end up having a resulting change in preference. So at the top is, is just a, you know, a capture of the, tutor the tutorial mode in Dota. And we have three heroes up there, Dragon Knight, Sniper, and, and Shadow Shaman. Um, because we, we said, hey, new players, you should play these heroes, that gives them you know, cues that, hey, the, the developers favor these heroes in some way. And so like, that is going to affect my estimations of their quality. Um, on the, I guess, the, the bottom left panel, so this is you know, um, pro players uh, playing in a match and the heroes they're using. And we show this to players uh, in the Dota client. And if you see pro players using various heroes, that is also social proof. Um, that is also giving you cues as, as to what, um, what heroes you should like and what your preferences should be. Uh, on the bottom right is the map selection screen in Counter-Strike. And you know, top left corner is Dust2, then Train, Mirage, Nuke, and so forth. We're saying, hey, play Dust2. Like, we're giving you an implicit guide. That's the, that's the map you're going to notice first. Like, we as game designers are cueing you um, to like Dust2, and that may end up actually influencing people to like Dust2 more than they would have if the, the map screen was randomized. So the, the implications here are that social proof will anchor, pre anchor preference. So what other players think will anchor preference. Um, what we as game designers um, convey to players in our games will anchor and can anchor preference. Uh, so how you display information to players like, has a profound impact on what they you know, actually end up liking about your game. It's, 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 um, you know, we'd like to, to hope that you know, kind of objective assessments of quality will, will emerge, but um, people look to cues to guide their decision making. Um, we always want to make it easier on ourselves, and our brain does this automatically. And so if, hey, the game designer is giving me cues as to, to what I should like, okay, I'm going to start liking them more. Um, Another point I want to make is that players will choose the default option. This is a, a well-known bias in psychology. If you have a, a selection, you know, like four choices, whatever is listed as the default, people in general, like not just players in our games, but people in general, uh, are more likely to choose the default option because it's a cue to guide decision making. And so like, this happens um, outside of games, and it definitely happens in, in, in games as well. And so just going back to, to kind of the, the map selection screen, um, if you truly wanted to understand a map's true popularity or quality, um, randomize this placement in your game. 
people might like it and play it the most because it's at the top of your map list. Um, you know, it's not always practical to, to do this change, but just understand that um, if you have a certain structure in your game, it's going to scope preference. It's going to influence preference. And so if you're truly after objective assessments, um, figure out ways to kind of remove the social cues that, that you're providing. Okay, so uh, that, that, that was in talking about ways in which uh, preferences can at least maybe not fail, but uh, are heavily influenced. So we're gonna talk about a, a few cognitive biases, which are just essentially um, systematic ways in which the, the brain kind of uh, tends to, to err uh, when making decisions. Um, so I'm gonna say we're neither as smart nor as rational as we think we are, not in a, in a demeaning way, but just in, in a more realistic way. Um, like, you know, there is, uh, our, our brain is using heuristics um, for efficiency's sake to, to help us, you know, navigate our world and to, to go through life. And the point here is that not everything, not all those factors that influence our assessments of situations reaches conscious, aw conscious awareness. Uh, you know, so we're conscious of a lot of things. Uh, there's a whole lot of processing going on below that level of conscious awareness. Um, your brain is doing a lot of work. And so uh, psychologists have studied for, for a while now um, the ways in which our, our brain is kind of biased in, in certain predictable ways. And you know, the, the hope is that uh, we can then use these biases to, to make better games. And so I'm just gonna talk about uh, I'll go, I have a list at the end, but I'll talk about a, cu a couple biases in more detail. So the, the first is anchoring. Um, we, we make decisions and evaluations of situations comparatively. So we're always looking for some benchmark, um, some threshold of comparison uh, to use. And what happens is we tend to anchor to an initial piece of information that's presented. Uh, and the important point for psychologists, and why this is somewhat surprising, is that this anchor, what we anchor to, what, this piece of information, doesn't have to be related to our actual decision. And so let me give you an example. So this is what I did. Uh, I went around uh, Valve headquarters, uh, I guess last week, and I asked the, uh, my coworkers for the last two digits of a social security number. So they would give me uh, zero, you know, zero, zero, all the way up to 99. Uh, some people were a little wary about that, and I was like, I don't need the other seven, just, just the last two. I then divided the responses into two groups. So I said, if you're low numbers, you're zero to 49, you're in group one. If you're the, the, the latter 50, the high numbers, 50 to 99, you're in group two. I then asked, how many heroes are there in Dota? I didn't ask anybody on the Dota team, but I asked everybody else this. So you're in group one, group two, how many heroes are there in Dota? There should be no difference in, in the estimates um, that were given. Right? Like, everyone, like on average, like people should you know, hopefully converge to, on, to on, I guess, on, on a single number. What happened was this. Group one, the, the low group, estimated 100 heroes. Group two, estimated 115. Uh, group one had anchored to a lower number, their lowest social security number, and gave me lower estimates. Group two anchored to a higher number, their higher social security number, and gave me a higher estimate. The actual answer is 112, if you guys are curious. Um, but just the notion here that uh, irrelevant information uh, can actually impact your decision making and your assessment of a situation. And so, so this is a silly example, um, in making the point that you know, irrelevant information can play a role in what we do. But what happens when relevant information is provided? So this is the map selection screen from Counter-Strike again. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, Dust2, um, also has an expected wait time, minute 12. Next to it uh, is train, an expected wait time of 4.48. Uh, let's see, yeah, so train, dust two, train, dust two, 112, train, 4.48, mirage, 2.47. So what happens here? Is anchoring happening here? Say oh, I wanna play train, and the expected wait time is 4.48. What happens if I have to wait six minutes? I've anchored to 4.48, and it's a six minute wait time, so I had to wait in a minute 12 longer than I thought. That's a negative experience. What if that expected wait time had said eight minutes, and then it, it took you six? So you got in two minutes quicker than you were expecting, right? So in both cases, you're waiting six minutes. In the first case, 
448. In the second case, it says eight minutes. The eight minute situation tend, leads to a better experience. Like displaying a higher number will likely cause players to be happier in the long run, which is somewhat counterintuitive. Um, you know, so we don't want to systematically you know, overestimate our wait times. Like, it doesn't seem like a great thing, but there actually could be positive consequences for our players. These are accurate wait times. Like we're, you know, we're, we're not playing around with any, with, you know, we're not doing any manipulations here. But you know, because we're saying, hey, these are honest, we might actually be creating more negative experiences for our players than um, we would if we said, okay, let's put in, you know, build in a buffer and buff up the wait times. So that's one example of anchoring. There's another. Say I, I want to play train, but I look at dust. So dust, man, that 112, that sounds pretty good. So all of a sudden, I'm initially I'm, I'm loading up Counter-Strike. I'm like, I want to play train. If it's a reasonable amount of time, I'll play. So 448, I have to decide if that, that's worth my while. Now dust 2 is a minute 12. So all of a sudden, like, my frame of reference changes. Like my, the axis of comparison I'm using changes, and I'm anchored to this lower wait time, this minute 12. And so now I have to decide, do I want to play train in four minutes and 48 seconds, I'd want to play dust two in a minute 12. Right? So the information we're presenting to players like, impacts their decision making and changes like, how they evaluate a situation. And so their desire to play train in a vacuum is not the same as their desire to play train when anchored to the minute 12 wait time for dust. So yeah, so it's just kind of highlighting the point that you're all of a sudden like the axis of comparison shifts from uh, playing train or not to playing train at a particular time versus playing another map at a particular time. So anchoring was one cognitive bias. Here's another. Uh, so what I what we refer to as framing, and, and simply speaking, the, the framing is the, the manner of presentation of a choice affects the response. So I can ask you the same question, the same content, but in two different ways and you're going to respond differently, or you're likely to respond differently. And w w one way to think about this, or one kind of common finding that comes out of this, is that uh, you can frame the same question as um, you know, avoiding a loss or acquiring a gain, and people tend to be averse to losses and oriented towards gains. And so let me give you an example. When WoW first came out, uh, folks at Blizzard were a little concerned about people playing for too long. Um, so what they did was they said, OK, you can play for a few hours at basic playtime. Uh, and get 100% XP gain. And you know, on average, you might earn 1,000 XP per hour. Um, and then after, let's say, I'm, I'm making up numbers now, say after three hours, um, it's reduced play time, and we'll give you, you know, you can still play, but we'll give you reduced XP. So they wanted to you know, not get people burned out on the game. They wanted to encourage people to stop. So they were like, you play for three hours, you get 100% XP, and then afterwards, you get half XP. Uh, so on average, 500 XP per hour. Players did not like this. So what did Blizzard do? They rescaled things. They said, all right, uh, we're going to give you bonus XP, 200% XP, for the first three hours. You're still going to earn, on average, 1,000 XP per hour. Then, after the three hours is over, we're going to give you the base XP of 100%. And so you're going to earn, on average, 500 XP per hour. Uh, players like this a lot more. right? The actual XP gain was identical, right? Nothing changed about the system. The only thing that changed was a text string or two saying you are quite, you're in possession of a gain and the gain is going away, you're getting a bonus, the bonus is going away, versus, oh, you're getting a penalty um, and we're applying the penalty now, right? So the actual XP gain was identical. It's simply how the XP gain was presented to players, right? Um, they were getting a bonus versus um, suffering a penalty. So uh, I'll go through these really quickly. And this list is, I don't want to like, talk at you guys forever just by, by reading things. But um, the, the point here I, I just want to make is that um, you know, there are a whole host of biases like these that, that come into play in our decision making and our evaluations and our thinking. And so um, being aware of them can, can help, you know, hopefully make us you know, lead to smarter decisions. So, Really quickly, a recency bias, we tend to think about what, what happened most recently when assessing a situation. Confirmation bias happens in, in politics a lot, but we tend to, to seek out information that confirms our beliefs and, and avoid information that will disconfirm our belief. Uh, the false consensus effect uh, is the notion that we think that everyone else is more likely to agree with us than they actually are. Uh, you may have noticed this, this phenomenon. 
Uh, hindsight bias, uh, things that, um, we tend to view things that happened as more likely uh, in hindsight than they actually were. So um, after something happens, we're like, oh yeah, of course it was gonna happen, and we kind of rationalize our decision making around that, but that's not actually the case. Uh, the endowment effect is, is, is kind of interesting. Uh, we tend to um, value things more highly when we own them. So if I say, how much are you willing to pay for this in-game item, you might say $5. As soon as you have the $5 item, you immediately value that item higher, and you might say, I'm only willing to sell it for seven. Uh, it's a common finding across a, a wide range of things, and, and it has, you know, there's, there's ways that can be played with um, when you're thinking about in-game items and, and various things that people will possess in your games. Uh, but the last three are kind of interesting as well. So the, the mere exposure effect is simply this. The more times you see something, the more favorably you tend to view it. So this is an argument in favor of marketing. Um, if you see something more often compared to something you haven't seen, you're going to you know, view higher the thing that you saw more often. And it's just the, the mere exposure effect. The mere exposure leads to, to a greater liking for a thing. The, the biased blind spot is simply that uh, you believe that other people are more likely to suffer from these biases than you are. So it's a cognitive bias about cognitive biases. Um, and then the, the last one is an interesting one as well. So the, the peak end rule is this. When we're evaluating an experience, like how much do I like this game, how much do I like this movie, how much do I like listening to this album, and so forth, we don't say, what was my average feeling across the entire experience? That's not what we do. We take a shortcut. And so what we do is we say, how did I feel at the highest point, at the peak? And then, how do I feel at the end? Or how did I feel at the end? How did I feel at the peak? How did I feel at the end? And then you average those two times together. And that's how your assessment of the experience. So you know, implications for us as game designers, um, you know, it, it may be tough to know when an, you know, a game's peak is, but you better be really, you know, it's really important to, to nail the ending, to stick the landing, because that will have a profound impact on people's assessments of your game. Um, like, you know, it's like, we, it'd be great if people just said, oh yeah, across the whole experience, this is what I felt. That's not really what people do. Some people can do that well, but in general, when you're thinking about an experience, you're like, how did I feel at the high point and how did I feel at the end? And, that, and that's how you assess things. So implications for game design, for these cognitive biases, obviously decisions can be influenced and shaped in somewhat predictable ways. For, for the two biases that I talked about, understand what players are anchoring to. So understand the basis for comparison. Um, and you realize that decisions and optimizations will shift depending on what anchor you're showing to players. Um, and then for the framing side of things, you know, be aware of the reference frame. Like, how you present things um, to players matters. If you frame something as a gain or a loss, like, that will have a profound impact on how they react to things. So tend to, to err on the side of framing things positively, you know, giving bonuses as opposed to, um, to penalties and so forth. But just understand that um, the same situation can be presented to players in a variety of ways. We have choices about how we do that, and that will impact how people react to them. Oh, and maybe the most practical piece of advice I can give you guys out of this talk, this is uh, in using the anchoring uh, in, in everyday life, always say the first number in a negotiation. Uh, if, you have a 75, if you want a 75K salary and your boss wants to offer you 50, if you say 75, you guys are going to anchor to that higher number. If he or she says 50, you guys will anchor to that lower number. So whoever says the first number first sets the anchor for the negotiation. So just something to keep in mind, um, you know, when you're in, deal, you know, in, in everyday life, think about, um, you know, what the anchor is and what you want it to be and try and make use of that accordingly. So choice blindness and internal reflection. Choice blindness is something I'll dis the define on the next slide, but re really this section is just about uh, internal reflection. So how, how do we determine, you know, why we do the, the things that we do, right? So yeah, what, what I just said. How reliably do we know why we do what we do? Um, and, you know, I guess in, as a in consequence, or maybe more, more specifically, how reliable is the feedback we receive from players? When players tell us why things are the way they are, you know, how reliable um, are those, you know, assessments of kind of our, our internal monologues? So let me give you an example of a phenomenon in psychology that, that touches on this. So this is called choice blindness. I'm going to ask you to choose one of two alternatives. I'm going to say, hey, here are two people. Tell me which one is more attractive, you know, person A, person B. Uh, here are two jams, you know, tell me which one tastes better, jam A or jam B. Uh, which of these two gambles are you more likely to choose? Um, which of these two moral judgments are you more comfortable making? That kind of thing. So essentially, just a choice between two options. 
I'm then gonna distract you. Like, so, like, do a crossword puzzle, watch a video, sit quietly, uh, play on your phone, do whatever. I'll distract you for a few minutes. I'm then gonna ask you to justify the choice of the alternative that you did not choose. If you chose person A, I'm gonna give you person B and tell me why did you choose person B. If you chose jam B, I'm gonna give you jam A and tell me why did you like jam A better. Uh, more than half of you are going to give me a reason why you made a choice that you did not actually make. Uh, right? It's just like, um, you know, this has been replicated a, a bunch. And, and again, you know, uh, somewhat of an artificial experiment, but it, it's, uh, it does illustrate an important point is that we're not great uh, at explaining why we do what we do. Some of us are. And, you know, if we, if we sit and, and, and be reflective, we, we can get to, uh, to pretty good places. But we're often cued in various ways um, by things. We, we latch on to convenient explanations for things. And so if somebody is saying, yeah, this is the thing that you made, like you end up actually, then you have to construct a rationale for a choice you did not make. And we are very good at constructing rationales. Um, so the implications here, um, be wary of self-reports. Um, Incredibly useful, you know, whether it's, um, you know, email you get or feedback you get on forums or information you get from playtests where you're asking players why they did what they did. Just understand that this is not something we as humans are great at. Um, some of us are good, and you can get a lot of valuable data, but the, the point here, if, be wary of self-reports and use them as cues to actually look for behavior. Um, you'll notice I used the looming motion to capture attention. Hopefully that worked. Um, the, the, this is a really important point. Um, let self-reports give you insight into what might actually be happening, then go find a behavior to see if it's actually happening. If people are saying a weapon is imbalanced, go look at the data and see if it's actually imbalanced. If people don't like a map, then go see if they're playing the map or not. Some of these questions are really easy to answer and digging into a measurable behavior is, is you know, fairly straightforward, but sometimes it's more complicated and more tricky. But the, the point I wanna make is that just understand that What's happening up here is not always, uh, or what we think is happening, uh, what we think is happening up here, is not always an accurate estimation of what's happening. So, um, whenever you can, um, use self-reports to guide you, and then look for a measurable behavior. So, our next topic. I know we're, we're kind of jumping around a bit. There's a whole bunch of psychology, so I'm hopeful that all of these have utility to you guys in the end. So cognitive dissonance and player toxicity. And I'll define cognitive dissonance on, on the next slide. Player toxicity, you know, if anybody's played uh, online, which I assume most of you have, uh, you might notice that sometimes people are not so nice. Uh, sometimes there are instances of toxic behavior, and it would be great if we could figure out ways to reduce them. So let me define cognitive dissonance and then talk about how we can maybe use cognitive dissonance to, to help reduce online toxicity. So for cognitive dissonance, when thoughts and behaviors are inconsistent or opposing, discomfort arises. So you could think about, uh, I think of myself as a charitable person. If I'm walking down the street and I see a panhandler, but I don't give them any money, so I'm not charitable in that sense, uh, I might suffer dissonance later, right? I have the notion of myself as a charitable person, but I have this action where, or this inaction essentially where I wasn't charitable, and that creates conflict. Uh, that's one example. It's, but this could happen in a variety of contexts. When we do seek... Uh, sorry, when we do experience that discomfort, we seek to reduce it by altering, you know, one of the antagonistic thoughts or behaviors. And so if we can induce dissonance uh, in our players, maybe we can use that to change behavior in our games. And so let me walk you through an example of, of how we did that. So here's uh, a chat log in Dota that uh, you guys have probably never seen. Uh, this is not how most of the conversations go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, right, so it would be great if all of the conversations went like this. That's not always the case. They, they, they don't always tend to, to go like this, but it would be great if they did. Okay. So what happens, well, okay, so actually, let, let, let's talk, I guess there's one slide on why um, you know, people tend to, to be more negative online, and, and this, is, you know, this could be a whole talk in and of itself, and we can definitely uh, discuss this afterwards, but um, you know, there's the anonymity, um, Dota requires a significant time investment to play the game so that the stakes are high, 
Um, there are many decision points in the game where you can latch on to an opponent's mistake or a teammate's mistake uh, and, and lash out accordingly. Uh, there's a phenomenon known as the Dunning-Kruger effect, which if you say it pithily is uh, incompetent people don't know that they're incompetent, uh, which is uh, a more general way of saying it is uh, uh, we are not so great, unsurprisingly, at self-assessment. And so assessing our own level of quality compared to other people. And so I might think I'm a better Dota player than my teammates and uh, blame them for mistakes that I actually ended up making. Um, and a whole bunch of other factors as well. Um, not really the focus here, but just understand that um, you know, trying to tackle any one of these things maybe can, can have a, an impact on reducing toxicity. So in Dota, if, if somebody is a dick, you can report them. You can click on their name on the scoreboard, and this dialog will pop up. I know it's, I think it's tough to read, but it says, essentially it just says report player, and you can select a category, communication abuse, intentional ability abuse, uh, intentional feeding. Uh, and then you can report them. So this is a, a well, it's, you know, I said talking about measuring behavior. We can look at the number of reports as an indication of, you know, how toxic the community is, for example. One thing we used to do in Dota was at the end of a match, we would say, we'd give you a survey and say, hey, please rate your enjoyment of the match. One to five stars. You, didn't have to, you don't have to answer if you don't want, but if you did answer, one to five stars, please rate your enjoyment of the match. And we could correlate that with, you know, trying to get a overall, like, you know, I guess, get the overall temperature of the player base and see if, correlate that with specific behaviors in a match and trying to understand better, um, you know, why people had a good time or had a bad time. And that, useful. Not the focus here, though. After we did this for a while, we ended up adding two more questions. So here's the first. Teammate cooperation. Please rate the cooperation your teammates displayed in the last match. One to five stars. So you can say, hey, I had good teammates, I had bad teammates. It's great, we can make use of this data in various ways, like feed it into matchmaking. I'll be honest with you guys, I didn't care about the answers to this question at all. Only reason we asked this question was so we could ask the next one. Your cooperation. Please rate the cooperation you displayed towards your teammates in the last match. So what happens here? We have a self-serving bias. We want to rate ourselves highly. So I'd love to say I was a good teammate and give myself five stars. If I was a dick in the game, I know that I can't honestly do that. So I have two conflicting notions in mind. I wasn't a very good teammate, but I want to rate myself as a good teammate. That induces cognitive dissonance. So the hope was that if we did this, people would experience dissonance if they wanted to rate themselves highly but knew that they weren't worthy of such a high rating, and they would adapt accordingly and then hopefully moderate, or mo I guess modulate their behavior, moderate their behavior, and then the next time they saw the survey, they could answer it honestly. So we did this, this was the only change we made on the behavior side of things at that point in time, and what we saw was this. Um, about 137,000, a 12.5% decrease, fewer reports per day, uh, simply just by adding the survey. So this is across millions of players and millions of games going forward, right? Simply just by adding a survey, or, you know, two survey questions essentially, to induce cognitive dissonance. So takeaways here, inducing dissonance can, can definitely lead to meaningful behavior change, and you can, it's not a, doesn't need to be a costly manipulation, um, and you can do it subtly, uh, and it, it's important to think about the attitudes you're priming in your players. And so if you can prime them to want to act in various ways, as, as we did with the survey, um, then sometimes they will act in, in, in ways that make everybody happier, 137,000 times a day happier. So I have a, a, a few slides on player agency, uh, just because I, I think it's an important topic, but I don't want to dwell too much on it. But I feel like it, it, you know, there's the, the point needs to be made. I think this, this might be something that, that most folks are aware of, but it, it's, um, you know, when we do lose sight of it, it, it can have consequences for our players. So we like to feel like we can exert control in our environment, uh, in any situation. I want to feel like I have some have semblance of self-determination, so how psychologists refer to it. So we want our actions to have an impact. And so when you design, you know, how much agency are you giving to players? as designers. It's an important point to keep in mind. It's a useful question to ask whenever you're making a decision. So here's the report dialogue again. Um, you know, somebody's a, somebody's a dick in Dota, you can report them. 
if you report somebody in Dota and they get a bunch of reports, we'll ban them from matchmaking or put them in low priority or prevent them from communicating in games. We'll give them a penalty. When that happens, we let you know that we did that. Thank you. We recently taken action against one or more players you previously reported for bad conduct. So you had an action, reported someone, we took action on your action, and then let you know about it. Right? So we're giving players agency. There was an action, and there was a consequence, so you reported a player as the action, there was a consequence, the player got banned, and here's evidence of that consequence. Somebody you reported, we took action against, we banned. Right? This is a really important point. Like, we could have just had the report dialogue and made use of it and banned people. Closing the loop was incredibly important. Um, it gave players a sense of agency, made them feel like they could have an impact on their environment. I don't like dealing with negative players, and so I want to be able to change that. This is evidence that you had you know, a way of you know, changing that. Right? Like we're giving you evidence that, yeah, you can change the thing about your environment that you do not like. That is giving players agency. The other point I want to make is that small amounts of agency can be just as valuable as large amounts of agency. Um, it, it's not always practical to, to give players um, large amounts of agency in various ways. Agency is more of a binary thing, more of a dichotomy as opposed to a continuum. As long as players feel like I have a small amount of agency, like that's all they need. And so like, you know, a silly example or a somewhat silly example of agency, think about in Madden um, when the weather uh, for a game is the same weather as what you're experiencing in your current location at the current time. Right? That's my environment is impacting my game's environment. It maybe doesn't feel like agency, but it, that's actually giving players agency. Like they're having an impact on the environment and they're changing things. Small things like that can have a profound role in how players perceive things. So final topic I want to get to, motivation. So why are people playing our games? Motivation, broadly speaking, is you know, the kind of the, the mechanisms that, that drive behavior. Um, and the, the broader question, you know, hopefully of interest for us, is how do we keep players engaged with our game, with our games? So there are, broadly speaking, two, two classes of motivation, or two, two factor, two kinds of motivation. The first is you know, experiences that are intrinsically satisfying, that are internally driven. Like I'm doing it because I just generally enjoy it. Uh, you know, using my, the, the happy team in Team Fortress as my metaphor for intrinsically enjoying something. The other approach um, is the use of extrinsic rewards. Right? So getting items in a game, having uh, a level bar fill up, get, uh, unlocking achievements, um, opening a case and getting a reward. Um, so any any reward, anything that you're given um, as a consequence for doing an action will be an extrinsic reward. Uh, something is happening externally to you um, and you are doing the activity to acquire that thing that is external. So the, the, the points that are useful to think about here, so intrinsic versus ex extrinsic, internally motivated versus external rewards, intrinsic re behaviors tend to last longer. If I'm doing something because I generally enjoy it, I'm gonna do it more often. Uh, I'm less likely to stop doing it. They're more difficult to extinguish. Uh, and I'm gonna rate it higher. Uh, I'm gonna lead to greater enjoyment. If I have a friend uh, who is a good artist and I say, uh, make me a dream catcher, um, and she makes it for me and gives it to me, she enjoys making them, she's gonna rate that experience higher than if I said, I'll give you $100 for that dream catcher. All of a sudden, I've given her an external reward for that, for that activity and she's not gonna enjoy it as much. So intrinsic behaviors you know, have, have these admirable qualities. Extrinsic behaviors, rewards, very useful for shaping behavior to get players to do various things in our games. Um, but the, the, well, the, an important point to keep in mind is they risk shifting the motivation for playing. If I'm doing something intrinsically, and then all of a sudden I'm given a reward for doing that same activity, my motivations for doing the activity might shift to acquire the extrinsic reward. And in that case, uh, it may not last as long, and I might be more likely to stop doing it, and I'm not going to enjoy it as much. So it's an important point to keep in mind that motivations can and will shift. So if it, intrinsic behaviors you know, have these great qualities, how do we foster intrinsic motivation? How do we get people to enjoy things intrinsically? And so there's a variety of theories on, on you know, how to foster intrinsic motivation. Uh, here, here, the points I'm going to talk about are generally accepted is, is, is you know, kind of um, 
doing a good job in this area. So we'll just go through them. Uh, I, you know, I talked about agency in my last section, and it, it's fundamental to somebody intrinsically enjoying something. It's feeling that they have autonomy and agency. Autonomy is essentially uh, the ability to control one's own fate, and agency is the ability to act on, you know, to perform actions that contribute to, to owning one's fate. So it's maybe superfluous terms, but uh, the notion that I have um, the ability, I, I'm able to make choices uh, that can impact my environment, impact my, my situation, and uh, will let me do what I want to do. So if you give players autonomy and agency, uh, you should also give them the ability to progress on, on some axis of performance. When we're performing an activity or an action, uh, we want to get better at it. We want to be aware that we're getting better at it, whatever we're spending time on. So make sure that any skill progression that's happening is apparent to the player. Um, and give them feedback on that, on that performance, on that skill progression. Uh, this is what you did poorly, and this is how you get better. So understanding how I can get better at something and what I did well at that, that's incredibly important. So have skill progression and have feedback on that skill progression. Let people know, hey, you're at, at this point in the, I guess, on the path to get to here, do this. Um, the, the final point to keep in mind is that, and you know, I'm reluctant to use generalizations, but, but I will here, uh, a, a large percentage of what we do as humans is driven by the desire to make positive social comparisons. Uh, we want to look good to other people. Um, so give your players opportunities to look good to other people. Uh, you know, leaderboards are a canonical example of this happening, right? Like, I, ha I am able to show how good I am to other people. Um, all of these factors lead into intrinsic motivation. So what are the implications for game design? You know, when, it, when you can, work on satisfying the intrinsic needs of a player. Uh, use extrinsic rewards to incentivize behavior where you need to, but just understand that you may shift a player's motivation, um, and there are consequences to that. So this is the, the final slide I have in the talk. Uh, you guys, may, maybe you can guess where this is going, but I'm going to ask you the question anyway. You have two discs, two sets of four discs, discs on the left and these discs on the right. And so the question that we ask people, which set of discs appear brighter? Anybody can answer if you want, or we can... Yeah. Right. right, yeah, so, so most people, I think about 90% of people will say the disc on the right. And the actual answer is that these are identical. These four discs in each picture are identical. They're the same discs. Um, and you can look pixel by pixel and, and match this up, and I'm happy to send you guys or show you guys the, the actual image, and you can sp spend as much time on it as you need to. The point here is that the context matters. So the background is shifting your perception. Right? And this has kind of been the, the point I've been trying to make throughout the talk. Um, the manner in which you present things to your players, the context in which things are presented to your players, can have profound impacts on the way you see things or what you like or don't like um, or how you make decisions um, or what your internal reflection is. Context matters. And so the, the hope of this talk was to convey the point that yeah, if we're more aware of the influences on behavior, um, you know, we can hopefully end up making better games. So thank you so much for spending time with me, guys. I greatly appreciate it.